Hi, everybody. Welcome to a, another fun podcast. This is very exciting. We are here to start sort of a new little project that we're going to be doing once a month, for now at least, uh, that we are going to be talking about the Criterion Collection, particularly the Criterion Channel. And uh, we're really excited to be doing this. For now, we're going to be calling it the Criterion Project. And uh, we're we're looking forward to it and uh i'm rachel and conrado is here hello rachel are you allergic to the 20th century (laughs) pretty much (laughs) maybe obsessed with the 20th (laughs) because now we're in the 21st century so that's good news for you that's right (laughs) yes so are you very excited about this new project that we're going to be doing uh i am very excited um about this project and i'm very excited that we're going to talk about the movie that we're going to talk about today especially excited about the criterion channel because i think you and i are in the same boat that we want to catch up on some of these classic and you know revered movies that we never find time to actually watch so finally we have created this excuse of the criterion project that we're going to be doing at least once a month for now um sort of assigning a movie to watch every month and then discussing it on the podcast. I think it's going to be fun. Yeah, I think so too. Because my, when I heard about the Criterion channel, I was, uh, you know, interested, excited. And I, I just worried though that I wouldn't really end up using it that much because that was sort of my hesitation for signing up for Filmstruck. It's because, I don't know, it's just some of these movies are kind of daunting and you want someone to sort of talk about it and so i was thinking who would be the best person to talk about the Christian mm-hmm. Green channel with and yeah. it's like obviously it's conrado the most and, pretentious person you know <laughs> and so uh, yeah i was <laughs> i said hey would you want to do this and you were up for it so hey here we are <laughs> yeah case in point we're gonna start uh today by talking about a movie that I think is quite pretentious, although we can get into it later. Um, yes. But we're going to talk about the movie Safe from 1995, directed by Todd Haynes and starring one Julian Moore. And we chose this movie because it coincides with two movies that are out now in theaters. Um, it is a little bit spooky, so we're thinking of Jordan Peele's Us, which... We have all seen over the weekend and we all loved, I'm sure. And uh, also, uh, Julianne Moore has a movie out, Gloria Bell. Um, Have you, is that playing in Utah, uh, Rachel? I think it's just coming uh, uh, to the Our House Theater, the Broadway. Uh, Yeah, so. It's really good. I just saw it last weekend. I watched the original Mm -hmm. uh, just to be ready. And. It was very already <laughs> yes. kind of shocking a little bit. I, was, I wasn't expecting that. I thought it was just like a fun, fluffy movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, so yeah. I, I, it will be interesting to see since it's got the same director mm-hmm. doing both films. Yeah, it's very similar to the... I did like it a little better than the original. Um, I think there's some interesting choices in the, in the music and the editing that makes mm-hmm. this one a little... I feel like it's a little tighter so we'll see we'll see what you think yeah that'll be fun so all right sure. so let's get into safe rachel yes. what do you think of this uh, or actually would you mind giving us a little bit of a plot description yes so basically safe tells the story of a, a woman named carol in 1987 uh, california who is she's kind of living this very uh sort of a blase uh, life in the suburbs, the favorite topic of many of (laughs) these type of movies uh, feel uh, that uh, she, she's, you know, her life in suburbia, she's got her husband and her child. And uh, one day she inhales all of this uh, fumes from this awful truck in front of her. And she starts to get really sick and uh things kind of get worse and worse and she she starts to think that she has this uh environmental illness where she's just 
allergic to everything around her and finally by the end of the movie she goes to this commune i'm gonna call is that a fair word commune Uh, um yeah i guess so yeah uh i don't know if you call it a cult or rehab whatever it is she goes to this place (laughs) and that's that's supposed to treat environmental illness and uh she just increasingly becomes more and more isolated the more sick that she is so that's sort Mm -hmm. of the the base plot yeah and and it's kind of this thing uh of like nobody really knows what's going on with her because she goes to the doctor and the doctor says everything is fine you shouldn't be feeling sick but she still has all these like you know basically like like attacks that she can't breathe and you know she's bleeding out of her nose and things like that and so it's a question of what is really going on um with carol is it all in her head or is she actually sick and why does yeah. nobody uh, believe her yeah is it psychosomatic or is it a real thing and, and especially when she goes to this place where she's kind of validated in it uh, mm-hmm. is you know what's going on with that yeah the movie is basically two halves right the first section is when she's in her suburban life and starts mm-hmm. to get these attacks and nobody really knows what's going on especially her and then the second half when she gets to the commune and everyone believes her they validate her whole what she's going through and she starts to i don't know i feel like that part is very very complicated i you know in the way yeah. that she starts to feel better about herself in that place but also we can see how her body is kind of deteriorating and this place seems a little bit like a cult and a little bit like an actual uh health center so it's kind of it's very disturbing i feel yeah yeah i think so too well and i i found the movie to be really interesting and i think that's one of those ones that you could watch oh and get something new out of it every time you watched it and it was interesting i was looking over my original blog because we did it for the old series hit me with a best shot that was such a fun series Uh, and i i was interesting because my original thoughts i was actually a kind of sort of sympathetic to her husband which might sound interesting but uh where i wasn't quite as much this time but but i just felt like in some ways i have a hard time connecting with really introverted characters i know shock shocker but (laughs) i i just like say something don't just you know like it's hard for me because i'm so extroverted that sometimes i find those kind of characters frustrating it's just like just communicate and so i actually and i do even to this extent a little bit this time feel a little bit of sympathy for him because she's just she has this huge change in like a matter of a month or two you know and he i I feel like he's not the worst as far as like going to appointments with her and like she just doesn't communicate very well at all Mm -hmm. i don't think about what's going on yeah so mousy and she's so so quiet and so in a certain way i think it's it's she can be kind of a frustrating protagonist Mm -hmm. it definitely feels i think you're right on the money and i think it feels very um to me at least feels very deliberate a very on purpose choice by todd haynes and i guess julianne moore's performance to make her kind of a, a cipher i feel like that she basically has no personality when she's living with her husband and her adoptive son they are basic she basically spends her days just like redecorating the house and drinking milk and she doesn't really have anything going on personally you know and it feels like she can almost uh, she can't communicate because she's almost like not alive so this disease is the only thing that like almost makes her human it's it's really it's a really interesting movie. Yeah. Like I said in, in my, my blog, I said, safe is one of those art house pictures where the suburbs are stifling and housewives do nothing but go to lunches and have babies. They try to make her husband seem like a bad guy, but I never really bought that. He doesn't ever get angry. He comes and visits her later on and he does ask questions. She's so quiet and mousy that I felt kind of sorry for him. How is he supposed to know what is going on when she is so non-communicative? So I don't know it's just an interesting kind of level to it because uh, I think that you're supposed to 
sort of be observing this and you're not necessarily supposed to be she's not like a hero Mm -hmm. if that makes sense absolutely i think you're absolutely right i think one of the things that makes this movie so good is that you know we've seen movies about the the housewife that you know is uh, not happy with her suburban life and we have seen movies about like these new agey communes and cults and that sort of thing and I think what's so interesting about this one is that uh, there are no easy answers he's trying to say a lot of things in this movie but there's mm-hmm. no easy like she's correct and and nobody believes her but she actually has this disease or you know the husband is so mean to her or this cult is so evil like she they just want to prey on her it's like complicated because her husband wants to help her and yet nobody knows what's going on with her and she can't really there's no science to back up what she's going through and then in this commune she's feeling better and she feels part of a community but also it feels like they are you know taking her money and putting a little bit almost as if they're putting the blame on her for her and on all these people who are there there's the cult leader um, gives these speeches about how it's all about you and how you feel inside. And if you're happy, you're going to feel happy. And it has nothing to do with the environment, you know? So it's this weird thing. Yeah. And, you know, she's smiling at the end of the movie. And there were t- I was listening to an interview with Todd Haynes and he said that it was fun, kind of fun for him or enjoyable for him to put this sort of false, false happiness, false happy ending. Mm. And that was what he was kind of going for. And uh, which is and it, which is really interesting. <laughs> yeah, it's such a disturbing ending too because she's, I don't know, because she's smiling and she's saying I, that she loves herself or whatever, but she looks so beaten up at that point, I feel like. Yeah. And it's so, and you feel so like, I don't know. It's like, it's a haunting image, I feel like, to how the movie ends. Well, and they just had the this birthday party and everything and so in a certain extent Mm -hmm. you feel like this is so much warmer than her previous life you know with her friends and going to lunch and whatever uh and her kind of bland home life and everything but yet is it well i think (laughs) the thing that's so interesting to me that i love about that birthday scene is where she gives her speech and she almost she doesn't say anything you know she's just repeating the things that this commune has been feeding to her and she can barely articulate anything about you know you know what i'm talking about yeah yeah and and that's the thing that was very disturbing right because it feels like she's making some progress and then you see that and you're like oh this place is like she's bought 100 percent into it but she is again becoming a non-person like she was when she was in suburbia yeah yeah Yeah, well and i kind of when i first saw it i thought of it as and i i don't know if this is what he was going for but thought of it as kind of a little bit of a an allegory on on mental health uh because it's that kind of thing that you try to sort of explain to people why how you're feeling but people don't understand it because they don't they're not in your head uh, and it's not something you can really like prove to people this is how i'm feeling and you want to find like the one thing that will solve it whether it's medicine or uh whatever and and but you can't there's nothing that will 100 percent go away in that it's always gonna be sort of part of your life and i don't know what he was necessarily kind of going for but that's i that's something i think about this these parts of our our life that we want to kind of share with the world but you in a way you can't really it's just so such an intimate part of who we are it's it's an it's an interesting thing yeah i think there's a lot going on here i think there's a lot of people who have also written about how this is somewhat of an allegory for aids and obviously there is aids is mentioned a couple times in the movie um the leader of the commune says that he has environmental illness and AIDS, but is still like, you know, living his best life, I guess. Um, So I think there is something there. And obviously the movie is set in 1987. So in the middle of the epidemic and all of that. So yeah, I think there's a lot to unpack in this movie. So um, we will, how about we move on to some of these questions that we have prepared for the podcast. So the first one is, what makes this a criterion film 
So before we answer that, let me give you a little bit of context about um, SAFE, which came out in 1995, uh, premiered at the Sundance Film Festival, and it was Todd Haynes' second feature, and his first with Julianne Moore. It got mostly good reviews, but it was, I guess, too small and too weird, maybe, for to actually uh, do well at the box office. It didn't really make that much money, and it didn't really get any major awards at the time, but you know, it grew over the years. And uh, by 1999, it was voted the best movie of the 90s in a Village Voice poll. And then uh, it has even grown since then, even much more. I mean, obviously it's part of the Criterion Collection and it has become sort of a cinephile favorite. You know, I don't think most regular people, let's say, know about SAFE or are really familiar with this movie, but I think in like cinephile circles, it's now regarded as one of the best movies of the 90s and I wonder do you think it's one of the best movies of the 90s Rachel uh no but I I think it's a really good movie I don't know if I would put it on there as one of my I, but I tend to like films with a little more gravitas like you're a uh, I don't know like I would pick Schindler's List as one of the great films of the 90s something like that mm-hmm. a Beauty and the Beast uh, would be up there things like i uh, maybe a little more mainstream but it, it's really good i wouldn't if someone had it on their list i wouldn't uh really argue yeah i would definitely put it on my list i mm. think at this point especially after this second watch uh-huh. um I, I am really impressed by it and i think there's yeah. so much just the fact that i watched it a second time and i had so much more to discover in it makes me yeah. really excited about this movie so well it really, it really was interesting to go back and read my review because i i had a quite a different response than the first time because i i mean it's not like i hated the husband character this time but it was just interesting to go back and read my review where i felt so kind of irritated her and sympathetic towards him uh mm-hmm. and uh, and i i think it it's nice when a movie kind of does that that every time you watch it you you can have a really different uh, experience i think uh, another book slash movie that's that way for me is the book the chosen and uh kyan patak's amazing book and every every time i read right i've read it different uh parts of my life i have a different very different response to the different characters and i i think that there's something in that with this as well like that interesting is that yeah. why you think this is a criterion film or what would you say to that question well yeah i think that it's just such a classic kind of independent type film it just feels so criterion so to such an extent uh and it really is it was in that almost sort of heyday of sundance where Mm. uh they were truly uh doing in really independent films you know that were made on with very small budgets and were very and uh one of the things that i mean i love sundance i go every year uh, i've just been this last year i saw 25 movies it was amazing uh so i love sundance but one of the things that kind of bummed me out this year is that it's just pretty much become corporate uh, mm. thing, a corporate experience with a few exceptions like for instance this year they had a uh, velvet buzzsaw uh, in the festival and it was released on netflix that week of the festival and you know it's, it's things like that that it's sort of frustrating you know like couldn't you give them the spot to something that you know really needed the exposure uh, it's, mm-hmm. it's instead of this uh so this netflix release and you know they had something like fighting with my family which i really enjoyed but i mean it's got the rocket really is that really a sense it's, it's so i don't know i just feel like it's sort of lost some of that true championing these tiny little movies and and uh, with sort of new and exciting up-and-coming directors uh that uh we we had uh back in the 90s and uh you know this is just it, this feels like if you were going to pick a movie to be sort of sundance in the 90s independent movies mm-hmm. in the 90s this is it this is the way you pick sure I, I can see that i can totally see that um i have a theory of why 
Well, I don't know if it's a theory. I think the the reason why it has become such a, you know, revered movie and considered such a favorite by critics, I think is has to do with the filmmaking. Because, um, so Todd Haynes actually went to school for semiotics, which is basically the study of symbols. And it's this very complicated field of study that I know very little about, except that you know, it's the study of symbols. So, and not just like words, like that would be more linguistics, but also like, you, you know, like um, what does the sun represent or what does a specific type of sign or the plus sign and things like that. Yeah. Um, so what you really see in a lot of his movies, I feel like, and especially here in Safe, is that everything sort of has a meaning and that makes him a very uh, meaningful director in the sense that you can focus on whatever choice he made and you can probably interpret it in a way or like find these sort of ways of of looking at it as a work of art and I think that's what makes him really exciting to film critics. I for example see one of the uh, biggest examples for me in this movie is how I noticed how in the first part of the movie when she's living in her California home Carol is sort of always framed between walls and and almost she feels like she's like in a box and like the the walls are closing in on her like every time she's like in the door frame or between two uh, pillars or things like that and then at some points the camera even sort of zooms in on her and makes it feel almost even more so like the walls are closing in on her you know and like she's losing space and she's about to be crushed by this world the environment that she's allergic to very yeah. interestingly then when she gets to the commune she stops being framed like that because she's starting to feel this freedom and she's starting to get better according to herself and she has this whole new environment that is free of this toxics and gases and whatever but then later when she gives her speech near the end the camera again closes in on her with the zoom like they did before and it, and it sort of told me oh no, Carol, this might feel like she's getting better, but she is still trapped just in a different way. And I think yeah. that's kind of like the sort of thing that he's going for and that makes this movie so um, rewarding to rewatch. Yeah, well, and when she is in her home, there's never a sense that, there's never a sense of comfort ever, like ever. She always feels like, there's painters in her house she's getting this perm she's uh, she's even when she's sitting there drinking her, the milk see yeah. she's stiff she's uh she's got kind of perfect posture she's never there's never a sense of it being her home really it's it's just yeah. very everything is white everything is stark yeah. it's just an it's it's a interesting thing and that is such a Again, talking about like symbols and semiotics, that seems to me like the fact that she drinks milk feels like such a symbol, you know what I mean? Yeah. For what she's going through. Also, obviously, the biggest symbol is probably the black couch when she gets the wrong couch and um, yeah, because she wanted teal, but she gets black. I think it's very interesting. That's all the like little details that you can like, you know, start to think, oh, what does this mean? And that sort of thing. Yeah, and you, know, you think if people were painting and you're having go outside, go outside. Like, <laughs> I don't know. There's just it, it's a <laughs> it's an interesting it's an interesting movie. Yeah. So I don't know. I just think it it fits everything that is a Criterion kind of collection, not only for kind of where it was in the indie f- scene mm-hmm. in the '90s, but also just yeah, everything about it. It's very Criterion. Great. So talking about yeah. Criterion, Sundance, indie movies, but let's go to our next question. Where do you think this movie fits in the what we are calling the pretension scale? So <laughs> there's a couple options here. Is the movie not pretentious at all? Is it pretentious and good? Is it pretentious but empty? Or is it too pretentious to function? What would you say? I would say it's pretentious but earns it. It it is. It's not a movie that gives you a lot of answers. It's not a movie that is a traditional narrative, so that will bother some people. They won't like it. Uh, but I think it earns it. I think it has enough to sort of say and leaves you kind of ans- asking enough questions, and and you're 
you're interested enough in the characters that and it is so well made and it's we haven't really talked about the sound design but sound mm. design is so great in this movie uh, yes they it's just the way they use sort of quiet white noise uh but then also the you can hear everything as far as like even things like when she's getting the perm and, and the way it's just everything mm-hmm. every sound is perfect they did a great job yeah yeah i agree the sound and i think all of the like technical aspects of the movie i think the cinematography is great the score is very eerie and unnerving the, yeah. there's some really interesting editing the art direction the costumes i think i agree with you i think i would put it in the pretentious but earns it section of the scale and i think it's because of what you say i think there are no clear answers but the filmmaking is so careful and there's so many details that you can build your own answers you know it's not like some of those movies that have no answers and then when you go watch them you can't find any hints of what the answer was this has a lot to give you even if nothing it's 100 percent clear yeah and i mean just even the whole title safe because she will she ever be safe i don't think so i i I don't think Mm -hmm. uh, and and you know what is that saying about about all of us you know what is he trying to say i mean it's obviously a movie that's trying to say stuff but i think it's it's sort of left up to the viewer of what they wanted to say and i like that i think that's cool yeah definitely there's a lot there in the title too like there's there's no wrong interpretation of this film i mean there's no wrong interpretation of any film but particularly uh you know this type of film is fun because it's especially open to interpretation and discussion yes absolutely yeah. can't wait to see how this film fits into the pixar theory <laughs> that's funny right all right uh, yeah. So we're heading towards the end. So how about our last question for today, which is, would you put it in your collection? And I guess you already own it. So, but you know, can you tell us why you bought it, I guess? Um, well, I was trying to sort of, I guess, beef up my Criterion collection and they had a sale and you had to get so many and they had in order to get the sale. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, uh, and, I was like, I don't know. I like that movie. I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and get it, and so that's why I ended up buying it. But yeah, I think it's a great one to have in your collection because it's got so many layers, and you can watch it so many times and get everything's out of it. And so I, you know, I think it's a good one. Yeah, I would also put it in my collection. I mean, I love the movie. I think it's great. Um, I don't know how many times I would see it. You know how often because it's such a it's a bit of an unnerving movie, I feel yeah. like, and it's and it's heavy, so it's not something that you will, I would pop in every week, let's say. But you know, it's. I think I would definitely want to have it just to like uh, pop it in every once in a while, like because it's such a rewarding movie. So you know, yeah, it's not the easiest sit, but it's like definitely worth it. So I would definitely recommend it. So what do you think about? We haven't really talked that much about the cult. Like, do you think? that or the commune or whatever we want to call it do you think those people have very devious intentions or do you think they're just or do you think they have good intentions or what do you think about all of that i think that's up for for debate obviously like most of the things in this movie um i don't think they're i mean one of the interesting things i think is they're not obviously evil right there's nothing there that tells us that they're like yeah these horrible people or anything like that there's a hint, though, when she uh, looks up the hill and the, the guy who runs the cult has this really big house where everyone else lives in these little shacks. I don't know if you noticed that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And so that made me feel like definitely she's paying a lot of money to be in this place. And the people who are here are paying money to be here. And this guy who's running the show is benefiting from that. Um, but that doesn't mean that he doesn't believe what he's saying and he doesn't believe that all of this is true it's complicated how do you feel about it um you know i when i first saw it i i really thought they i felt really good about it and i but then hearing him kind of talk about the director talk about it being this false positive it kind of made me think about it again and i'm like maybe it it really is i mean obviously there's some parts of it that were obviously sort of destructive and questionable but uh i don't know i 
and now kind of this time i'm thinking is this place going to end up with them all drinking kool-aid and you know that kind of an experience Mm -hmm. just that kind of a thing and and because she keeps crying uh she have these just sobbing fits and uh, after she goes and has one of these inspirational sort of meetings mm-hmm. that she'll come back and almost every time she's sobbing and so you're like well what yeah. and that that's one thing it can be a little bit because she is so introverted it's really mm-hmm. hard to know what she's feeling and then he, it ends with her smiling mm-hmm. and seemingly so cheerful but it's a false false ending happy ending so yeah. i don't know it's, it's i'm not sure uh, i actually i see that crying almost as the one of the most you know, recognizably human things that she does. Yeah. Um, so, so almost what I see in this is more like uh, this cult by the end is almost like numbing her again, just in a different way, right? Because the cult is so much about like, think positive and only think about the happy things in life and don't, you know, think negatively because it's going to give you another attack of, and going to yeah. do bad for your disease or whatever. So, she's kind of been numbed down in a way that she was in her suburban life when she didn't really have a lot of things going on. And she was just like the wife. And this disease is almost the one thing that it's making her be a human, I guess. And then this is almost like numbing her down again. So I don't know. It's almost like these structures don't let us be human. It's kind of like what maybe the movie's going for. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. Uh, You, yeah. On one hand, want to kind of, shake her a little bit like wake up what, what's going on but then another thing you want to give her a hug and be like it'll be okay <laughs> yeah <laughs> there's definitely no so i don't know it's an interesting it's an interesting thing i think it's a great performance though i think she's so yeah. good yeah it, she because was it's saying, a tough character like you say yeah she she was saying this was one of her very first like indie uh, independent roles that she'd ever done and she kind of decided from that point on that she would try to do sort of one movie for her career and one movie for herself after mm. that and uh mm-hmm. it, so you know it's kind of interesting that she took that from it yeah and i think i think that was a smart choice uh, for the most part i love julianne moore i think she's an amazing actress one of my favorites so yeah. i'm very happy that she keeps making interesting movies and not just you know uh, big studio stuff yeah uh, and i i think todd haynes is just such a great director he's somebody that you know that every single thing i mean i haven't seen every single one of his movies but you know when you watch a todd haynes movie that every shot is very thoughtful mm-hmm. and that he loves his characters he has such humanity for his characters it's very similar to me to uh corrida the the oh, watch yeah. corrida film you just know that corrida loves his characters and, mm. and or has such humanity for his characters and as opposed yeah. to i mean the ultimate contrast would be somebody like a michael bay who has <laughs> no love for his characters <laughs> right yeah i can totally see what you're saying i i think haynes is a is a really good director and definitely a very careful and thoughtful yeah. director I don't always love his movies, but the ones that I do, I really love. Like this and then Carol is one of my favorites. And even when I don't love them, like I'm not there, that Bob Dylan movie that he made is really, Uh I think that's just like too many symbols. It's really hard to decipher what the hell is going on there. But (laughs) it's very interesting at the same time because there's so much there. Yeah. Yeah. Very true. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So... Um, I guess that was safe for us. Um, Any final thoughts? Yeah. Well, just let us know what you think of it. And uh, it's, uh, it's a really, it's interesting to, for that some people call it a horror movie Mm. and uh, it kind of uh, transcends genres in a lot of ways. Like we were talking about with, uh, with Jordan Peele and in his films also in a way kind of do that. Uh, And because there are moments that it, it can be kind of oddly funny and mm-hmm. in, in here and then uh, really uncomfortable and uh, you almost have sort of a sci-fi film in, in sort of <laughs> moments, you know, with this, with certain aesthetics, I think. Yeah. But, uh, but then you have this 
definitely a lot of scary moments where she's going into spasms and, and things like that and or she's kind of out of control she's trying to control everything and mm-hmm. so yeah it's a, it's a really it's a really fun film really good film so let us know if you're listening what you think of safe and uh whether you would put it in your criterion collection yeah that would be really fun and let us know if you're going to be subscribing to the Criterion channel and what you think of this series. And maybe even uh, you can send out some requests of movies yes. that we, you want us to cover. Um, yes. We're going to be doing this once a month and we'll see yeah. how it's going. Yes. Um, great. So let us know. The Criterion channel, it starts on April 8th. And if you sign up now, I think you get a little bit of a discount of yes. a premiere member so we'll put a link down in the uh, description section if you want to sign up and uh, it should be pretty fun we're not gonna normally when we do this podcast we'll announce what we're going to be doing next month but because we don't know what will be on the channel we'll wait so just make sure you're following both of us on twitter and we will uh, uh we'll put out what we're going to talk about in april so yes that should be fun um, so this has been a little bit of a preview and hopefully yes. once the channel launches, if you haven't seen safe yet, it'll be up there and you can, you know, catch up with it and we yeah. can have more of a conversation. Yeah. Very good. All right. Well, thanks so much for, for doing this. I'm really excited. It's going to be fun. I am very excited. It's always <laughs> a pleasure to come and talk about movies. Yes. So, uh, where can people find you on social media and all that fun stuff? Um, so on Twitter, I am at Coco Hits New York, and I also have a blog, which is CocoHitsNY.wordpress.com. And every once, uh, once a month, I've been writing at this website, AlternateEnding.com. So you can find some of my uh, writing there since I, am, I have fallen behind a little bit on writing on my own blog. But you can count that every once a month, I'm going to be posting something over there. Great. Great. And you can find me at Rachel's Reviews, all of our social media. And if you're listening to the podcast on iTunes, you can give us your ratings and reviews. Really appreciate it. And if you're listening on YouTube, please give us a thumbs up and subscribe. And just let us know uh, what you think about this idea, because you know, we're definitely uh, open to letting it grow as much as possible. So uh, anyway, that will be great. And uh, we'll look forward to next month. So. Thanks so much. Bye. See you.